<clears throat> Alright, I'm back again. I just had a little bit of a slip on the rear tire. Fish filled the rear tire going in a straight line somehow. I think I was going through a puddle. I guess I was accelerating a little too hard or something, and uh, the rear tire fishtailed a bit. So I stayed on the gas a little, and it sort of straightened itself out. So, so this was fishtailing. No, it wasn't. This is this wasn't head shake. This was uh, fishtailing off the rear the rear wheel. some time ago from a viewer who said that the Red Hot Chili Peppers recorded an album at some point in a house on Laurel Canyon Boulevard. And I've kind of been putting it off because it's uh, Laurel Canyon's uh, uh, road, the road with some poor pavement. And as far as I can recall, there aren't really any good places to pull over on it. I mean, everything pulls into someone's private property or driveway. Uh, I checked it out on the maps, on Google Maps, and uh, I think I can find a spot there. Oh yeah, so while we're in the city, I had some city riding related things to talk about. Uh, one of the things is, uh, that I learned recently that I didn't know is that motorcycles pollute a lot more than cars per mile traveled. I bet you didn't, I bet you didn't think that. Uh, bikes are definitely more fuel efficient. You burn less gas. But um, the amount of uh, hydrocarbons and uh, oxides of nitrogen and carbon monoxide that they put out is as much as 15 times a car, a modern car. Like, for example, I think a uh, typical car, like the one in front of us, probably puts out 12 grams per ki no, it puts out like, something like 2 grams per kilometer, I think, um, of carbon monoxide, and uh, in terms of hydrocarbons, which is the primary contributor to smog, a car, a typical car will put out something like 0.25 grams per kilometer of, uh, of hydrocarbons, whereas the motorcycles, the motorcycles, the motorcycle emission standards are something like 12 grams per kilometer for uh, carbon monoxide, and, as much, and the current 2000, the upcoming 2008 standard will be 0 0.8 grams per kilometer for hydrocarbons and uh, oxides of nitrogen combined. So 0.8 versus 0.2 for cars. So that's just food for thought. You're using less gas, but you're pumping out more pollutants into the atmosphere when you're on a motorcycle. Someone brought that up on sporttouring.net, and I thought that was kind of an interesting topic. The tires are uh, really cold right now, so um, one rule of thumb I've heard is you should ride for about 20 minutes of moderate moderate riding to uh, get the tires warmed up. Sounds like a pretty good rule of thumb. On a really hot summer day, the temperatures are like over 100 degrees, and the tires probably warm up within like five minutes or less. And it's entirely possible that your uh, tires won't ever reach maximum traction, their maximum traction potential, if the weather's cold enough. They'll just never reach that maximum stickiness. I've also uh, heard that uh, weaving left and right doesn't actually help warm up the tires. I don't know if the people in uh, MotoGP do that just to look cool or what, but um, but that's 
what I've heard, that you don't really, it doesn't really do anything for your tires warming up when you weave left and right. Maybe it scuffs them in a little bit, you know, roughens them up, as opposed to just, as opposed to heating them up. I don't know if you know this, but uh, race tires are completely treadless. Race tires are completely smooth, and they only last for about one race. And then um, qualifying tires, because you have to, you want to, you know, you want to get the best qualifying time so you can get the pole position in a race. Those qualifying tires are designed for um, the qualifying tires last one lap. And that's it, because they're just trying to go for their best possible time. Yeah, so that was a, a little aside about tires. And here we are at a red light. Like, if this were like a four-way intersection, I was trying to make a left turn. What I usually do while I'm waiting for the light to change, after I check to see who's going to hit me from behind, uh, I'll scan the path. And I'll sort of predict what my path will be when the light turns green. And I'll be checking to see if that... Just a minute. Just a minute. I just think I'm going really slow because I'm going slow, but uh, I'm, like, I'm videoing right now. I'm trying to get a little bit of time out of this, this stretch because I'm almost at my destination here. Um, yeah, so uh, you track your view through the intended turn that you want to take at the intersection just to check to see if there's anything there, like uh, just to check if there's um, debris or an oil spill. See, I don't know. I've never seen the oil spill. I hope I never do. But a coworker of mine, I didn't even know he rode a motorcycle, but he rides a Yamaha VMAX cruiser, and uh, he was somewhere in a more, somewhere downtown or something like that. And uh, he was taking a left turn. So he's taking a left turn, and um, he hits an oil spill that he couldn't see. He was riding at night. And I think he sort of lost control and went off into a curb. And then he sort of bounced off the bike and hit his body sort of bumped into a car lightly. And uh, he, he was okay. He was wearing a fully armored leather jacket, but he wasn't wearing any riding pants, so he got some uh, road rash on his legs. That reminds me, you know, so that, that should serve as a bit of a warning that you always survey your path when you're at a traffic light to make sure there's nothing that's uh, that's going to cause you to wipe out as you're turning. A, it's, uh, it's a bit of a hassle, of course, if you drop your bike in an intersection and traffic has to stop for you. And of course, naturally, it's a little bit embarrassing when that happens, so you want to make sure you're not going to go down an intersection. Thing. All right, now I'm getting close to where I'm headed. 